Hello and a very warm welcome to this digital conversation on Southeast Asia Returning to Work, co-hosted by the UK ASEAN Business Council and the ASEAN Business Advisory Council in partnership with ACCA. We are delighted to have Dr. Kwong, the chair of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, to deliver some brief welcome remarks, along with a stellar cast of speakers from across the region, from both UK and ASEAN companies, in a discussion led by Baroness Neville Rolfe, chair of the UK ABC. We will shortly hear a presentation from Jenny Gu, president of ACCA and CEO of Richmond, China, followed by a panel discussion with Joey Concepcion, CEO of RFM Corp, as well as being President Duterte's advisor on entrepreneurship, an ASEAN back member for the Philippines. Shinta Kamdani, CEO, Sintesa Group, and Vice Chair of CUD in Indonesia, and Tony Crisps, CEO of HSBC Singapore. I'm Alan Lai with the UK ASEAN Business Council based in Brunei, and I have a couple of notes to highlight before we begin. Firstly, we would love to hear your thoughts and questions and invite you to post your questions and comments in the question box on the right hand side of the screen and our chair will pass them on to the panel. And secondly, a very quick advert, our next digital conversation with the ASEAN Business Advisory Council will be on the future of fintech in Southeast Asia on the 8th of July where the Lord Mayor of the City of London will join us. Details will be sent out with a digital goodie bag you will receive after this session. And now to begin. Baroness Neverolf is well placed to guide this discussion, having had three careers in politics, in business, and in the civil service. A former UK government business minister, she has also served as a board director for Tesco and other leading multinationals, and is now an active peer in the House of Lords, as well as chairing the UK CBC. Baroness Neverolf, over to you in London. Alan, thank you very much indeed, uh, and welcome to you all. I think those of you who know me know of my passion for Southeast Asia and for ASEAN and for uh, developing it, relationships right across the region. Um, welcome everybody, um, particularly Dr. Kwong um, and, the, um, th and thanks to him and the uh, ASEAN Business Advisory Council for co-hosting today's conversation uh, and of course for the input of the ACCA. Uh, I mean, we are, hope today is to give our members an understanding of the challenges facing business as they return to work in different parts of Southeast Asia because of COVID-19. You know, how is business looking forward to the new normal uh, and what is the forward look for the rest of the year? But without more ado, I'd like to in invite Dr. Huang, who is in Hanoi, uh, to give some welcoming remarks. Dr. Huang. Okay, thank you very much. Dear Madam Baroness Nevin Rofer, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of ASEAN BAC, I would like to express my warmest welcome to all participants for taking time to attend today's meeting, talking about ASEAN returns to work. I would like to express also my thanks and appreciation to Madam Baroness Nevin Rofer and UK ASEAN Business Council for organizing this digital conversation in a very, very special time when people in ASEAN returning to work during uh, this pandemic COVID time. So this topic is a very interesting. ASEAN people return to work. I think that uh, uh, unlike in the UK, ASEAN people, we are very, very poor people. So we have to return to work so that we can make money make money we don't have much money at our banks so i today i believe that this meeting is very good for both uk and also asean and also for vietnam so as you may know that you know nowadays in asean in asean in vietnam we have two tasks the first one is saving lives of people and second one is reopening our economy and make people return to work uh, in terms of saving people time in Vietnam, for example, uh, Vietnam, we also established the National Committee on uh, Fighting COVID-19. The chair of the committee is the vice prime minister of uh, the country. And we did a lot of uh, things to, uh, to, to, fight, to fight the uh, COVID. And nowadays in Asia, especially in Vietnam, we uh, have <coughs> the, the uh, decreasing number of uh, cases new cases of COVID-19. 
And in Vietnam, for example, now we recorded only uh, 349 uh, new cases. Uh, effects infected, you know, and um, also uh, in terms of uh, reopening economy uh, in Vietnam, uh, we uh, our government we have lifted its social distancing measures, and most uh, non uh, essential services have reopened and domestic tourism is uh, resuming. Unfortunately, we also uh, still close our border. Uh, since then, Vietnam and other ASEAN uh, members countries we started a new normal. With aim to achieve double goals to be safe with COVID-19 and continue to develop the economy. And uh, uh, as you may know, that uh, our business community, especially the Vietnamese one, uh, is also seriously affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, impacts. For example, a shrinking consumption market, lack of supply and of input material, lack of capital or cash flow and lack of a suitable labor force, and so on and so forth. And the Vietnam uh, government, we applied measures to help our businesses to, count, to encounter the COVID-19, including financial support package for poor people and businesses affected by the pandemic. We also extended the, the deadline for tax and land use fee, and also lowered the kind of uh, uh, corporate income tax for uh, SME, SME, small and medium size enterprises. And nowadays, uh, I think that, you know, uh, for individual countries in Asia, we also have uh, separate measures. But however, we need in the region, we have to have uh, the kind of uh, joint efforts in terms of uh, that we have some kind of mechanism as a regional level so that we can uh, save our uh, people lives and also uh, uh, reopen our economy. So as you may know that in the coming Friday, 26th of June, uh, ASEAN Bank as uh, the body to uh, have a recommendation to the, to the ASEAN government. We will have uh, some kind of uh, dialogue with the ASEAN leaders. And one of our recommendations is that we have to have some kind of mechanism in, uh, at the ASEAN level, regional level, so that we can have joint efforts to uh, fight COVID-19 and also to uh, improve or develop our economy in, in this situation. And we expect to uh, ask the leaders of ASEAN to uh, establish a kind of mechanism, so-called special high-level commission on COVID-19 and reopening uh, economy in the region. So I think that today is, uh, is a very good opportunity for all of us, UK people and also uh, ASEAN businesses to have uh, to, to, to get together to have meeting together, and uh, we also have very distinguished guests and speakers from uh, UK and from ASEAN uh, businesses. And hopefully, we can share our information, we can share our experiences, and uh, uh, so that we can make some contribution to the uh, development uh, between the UK and ASEAN, and especially in this special uh, situation. And once again, I would like to reaffirm that ASEAN map in general and Vietnam in particular when come cooperation with UK ASEAN Business Council in order to provide businesses with practical assistance and support to help them to survive this pandemic so that we can facilitate trade of goods and services prepare uh, and plan uh, to free uh, the flow of people trade and investment uh, for the post post pandemic uh, time and uh, taking uh, this opportunity again, I would like to thank uh, especially Ma Madame Baroness and also UK uh, ASEAN Business Council and all the uh, people participating in this today uh, meeting. And I wish today's uh, meeting success. And I wish the speakers and panelists have a very good discussion and looking towards uh, to collaborate with you in time to come. Thank you very much. Dr. Kwong, thank you so much and good luck with your meeting tomorrow um, and with your proposals for tackling uh, COVID, uh, the High Level Commission. I'm talking to the Director General of ASEAN next week as well, so it'll be interesting to see what he's thinking. Um, and I also look forward to seeing you and your council again um, in Hanoi in November um, because I'm hoping to bring a delegation to the you know, Business and Investment Summit in November. Um, and hopefully by then, COVID uh, 
controls on on the borders will have been lifted. <laughs> okay. um, I'd like I'd like to good. I'd like to move on if we may. I'd like to introduce my friend Jenny Gu, who's based in Shanghai, but is president of ACCA across the region and is also uh, CEO of Richmond China. Richmond is one of the largest luxury gr groups in the world, um, and sh but sh she has done great work with the ACCA, and they've done an excellent survey on the impact of the coronavirus on business, which I think will set us up really well for our panel. Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baroness. Uh, I'm Jenny Gu, Global President for ACCA, and very happy to be spending time with you today. Before we get into what I'm sure will be a very interesting panel discussion, I will try to set the scene by sharing some key highlights from a global survey that ACC conducted with business and finance leaders around the world. The purpose of the survey was to understand the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to their business and how they're responding to the situation. The first survey was conducted towards the tail end of March. A lighter follow-up survey was just concluded early June to track how things have changed and also to focus on some new themes. As I said, I will only be putting in front of you selected key highlights. You are welcome to pick up the reports later for a more comprehensive read. Next slide, please. I will focus on the Southeast Asia cut of the results. Out of the 10,000 respondents to the first survey, about 1,500 was from Southeast Asia. And the second survey attracted close to 5,000 respondents, out of which about 700 was from Southeast Asia. We managed to receive responses from a diversified survey population, which gave us really rich data to work with. The Southeast Asia story is, on an overall basis, quite similar to the global one. Next, please. Let us start by looking at the impact on business. Next. Please. This is a very busy slide, and I'm not expecting you to be able to read the words. We asked in the survey, what business impact has your organization faced due to the outbreak? Respondents, excluding those from the audit profession, were asked to choose the top five items in this list. What did we see? Employee productivity went down. That was chosen by the highest percentage of survey respondents and followed by cash flow, and then customers' orders. The ranking in Southeast Asia was identical to what we saw globally, but compared to their global counterparts, a larger percentage of businesses in Southeast Asia faced the cash flow issues, reduced the demands from customer, and a wider range of business impacts. Next, please. Next slides, please. For each of the top five business impacts selected by survey respondents that we saw in previous slides, we then asked them to indicate the severity of the impact on a scale of five, from moderate impact all the way to threat to viability in six months. The chart here captures the number of respondents who selected the severity at the second highest level. The picture is clear, cash flow problem ranked top for obvious reasons. And as we all know, it is a problem that is itself compounded by the other challenges, namely diving customers' purchases as well as reduction in employees' productivity. Businesses have been forced to focus on fixing the short-term day-to-day challenges and scrambling to maintain liquidity. Next, please. Next slides, please. Sorry for there's a yeah, there's a delay. As I mentioned that we conducted a second round of the survey in June. Clearly, the COVID-19 situation evolves quickly, and we wanted to get a sense of how businesses are adapting, whether the various challenges they faced are easing up or getting worse. The top three business impacts have remained the same, but the ranking has changed. Customers stopping or reducing purchases now rank as the top challenge. 
although we have to note that it was split into two separate factors for the March survey, so we can't directly compare the two results. Moving on to cash flow issues, the story is clear. As the pandemic dragged on, more are experiencing liquidity problem from 44% in March to 55% in June. Before we move away from this slide, I want to draw your attention to the fourth biggest impact in June. That's business deferring investments in new and enhanced productivity capacity. It has doubled from affecting about 20% of business in March to 40% in June, indicating that the protracted pandemic has forced more and more leaders to forego capital investments and concentrate on survival in the short term. Next slide, please. Here's the same chart for March, but analyzed based on respondents from small versus larger companies. Across the survey, there was where one of the most significant differences was noted. For small companies, cash flow was the most prominent problem. 56% of small companies in the survey highlighted the challenge with liquidity, compared to a much lower 34% for larger companies. The large gap remains in June, but with an even greater proportion of companies, both large and small, now facing cash flow issues. Large companies from 34% to 43%, and small companies from 56% to 61%. Next slide, please. We asked the business and the finance leaders the expected impact of COVID-19 on their revenue growth as compared to the previous financial year. Four out of five of them from Southeast Asia expected the revenues to fall based on their best estimates, which was similar to the 84% we saw at the global level. The red lines represent the worst case scenario. And here we saw more than 90% of leaders expecting revenue to fall as compared to last year. We are facing a very dynamic situation. How the business performs depends on multiple factors, including the scale and duration of the pandemic, success in control measures, and economic stimulus package introduced by the governments. Next slide, please. In the June survey, we see a worsening of the business and the finance leaders' expectation. The proportion who expected a more than 25% drop in revenue increased from 34% to 42%. Next slide, please. In terms of profits, about 70% of the leaders expect their organizations to be loss-making in the current financial year. We asked them how likely would that be a direct result of COVID-19, and more than two-thirds indicated that it is likely or very likely. Next slide, please. Let's now have a look at what the survey is telling us in terms of how business in Southeast Asia are responding to the pandemic. Next slide. It is encouraging to see that at early stage of the pandemic, instead of jumping straight into managing impact on loss of business and change in mode of operations, the vast majority of respondents very clearly prioritize the health and the safety of people, whether they are employees, customers, or other partners. We see that are coming through the top five measures already put in place by more than 50% of the respondents as of March. Next slide, please. The next question dwelled into specific measures relating to remuneration and employment models. And we can see that organizations started by picking off the low hanging fruits, recruitment freeze, freezing salary increments, cutting or canceling bonuses. As the crisis continues, as the situation deteriorates, however, nothing is off the table. More painful measures start to kick in. At the bottom, we see retrenchment, the measure left as the last resort. And even that has been implemented or considered already by more than 50% of the respondents. It is painful and it is difficult. 
Business leaders find themselves navigating the delicate balance between survival in the short term and recognizing that people are a strategic asset. And HR, any HR decisions made today will always carry with them longer term implications. Next slide, please. In the June survey, we asked the survey respondents how effective the economic stimulus packages introduced by their governments have been in supporting their business. Globally, about a third of the respondents said yes, the stimulus packages have been effective, and the 13% said no. We extracted and present on this slide the result for the country that attracted more than 100 survey responses from Southeast Asia. And for comparison, we have also included the UK and China as well. Incidentally, the three countries globally that had the highest percentage of respondents endorsing their government stimulus package were the UK, China, and Singapore, all found on this slide. And in Malaysia, the proportion of respondents who thought that their stimulus package was effective was about the same as those who thought it was not effective. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 11 different types of stimulus schemes were subject to evaluation by the survey respondents. This chart includes the five that were voted highest in terms of effectiveness globally, but we can clearly see variance across the different countries. For example, respondents from Singapore appear to be very satisfied with the government's wage subsidy related schemes, about double that in Vietnam and China. Health and safety advice and the support measures appear to inspire slightly greater confidence in ASEAN countries compared to the UK and so on. A more thorough analysis of the survey responses to this question, together with the previous one on the overall effect in this, may help policymakers reaffirm some of the policy decisions or steer to fine tune what has been offered. Next slide, please. A sound crisis response strategy starts with a business continuity plan, or BCP. An effective BCP offers some structure and process in the face of significant and unexpected business disruptions. Remarkably, however, almost half of the organization's survey either did not have a BCP or did not have an effective BCP. Not surprisingly, large companies have done better here with a larger proportion of 69% concluding they have BCP that were effective. In comparison, only 44% of smaller business were able to conclude the same, leaving them more vulnerable to the consequences. Next slide, please. This is the last chart that I am sharing from the survey. In the June survey, we thought that it would be appropriate to ask the respondents what they thought some of the more enduring business impacts from the COVID-19 are. 14 factors were laid out, and interestingly, the five that came in top globally and for Southeast Asia were consistent. For most of the countries as well, the top five were the same. UK and China have again been included in the slide for comparison with three ASEAN member states. The need for physical distancing has forced many businesses to allow their people to work from home, and this has clearly driven a rethink about the purpose of office space. Related to that, and recognizing that the virtual interactions will need to be enhanced, businesses are placing greater focus on investing in digital. And of course, investing in digital supports interactions with consumers as well as the new normal. The other three factors that round up the top five were prioritizing health and safety for both employees and the customers, learning from experience and improving on crisis management, management responses going forward. This was especially encouraging to see, given that the, the weaker results we noted in the previous slide. And of course, the third thing is rescaling, crucially important in a fast evolving COVID impacted world. Next slide, please. I would like to round up my presentation and ACCA recommends the three A's approach to responding to COVID-19 business impact, act, analyze, anticipate. 
from the survey report and then also separately from the ACCA COVID-19 Resources Hub, you will be able to find a very useful checklist laying out for each of the elements within the three A's, what the business leaders should consider. Every business is different and every leader approaches crisis management differently. As CEO of Richmond China, I personally find the checklist a very helpful framework a reminder to consider the adequacy of our business resumption plan. I do encourage you to have a look too. Next slide. And this is my last slide. And it shows the ACCA COVID-19 resource hub that I mentioned. Again, very rich source of guidance and information, including a vast library of learning resources to support our reskilling re journey. And I will urge everyone to explore. And I appreciate your kind attention. Let me now turn it back to Baroness to kickstart our discussion. Thank you. Jenny, thank you. That was terrific. Um, and we've now got the panel. The, the, uh, you can see who's joining the panel. And I'm going to go straight on, ask panel members to keep it brief so we have time for some questions at the end. Uh, I'd first like to invite Joey Concepcion uh, to uh, give some opening remarks. He's joining us from Manila. Um, he's President Duterte's advisor on entrepreneurship um, and, of course, is the president and CEO of RFM Corporation. Um, Joey, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting. Uh, uh, it's uh, almost 4.30 in the Philippines. Uh, thank you for inviting. And I'd like to share with you uh, what is happening in the Philippines. Uh, uh, our president, uh, Duterte, locked down uh, the entire, we have, the Philippines is divided into three areas, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. The focus of the uh, pandemic was basically in Luzon. So on March 15, he locked down the entire Luzon uh, to uh, uh, improve the health uh, care uh, as fast as possible. And uh, we've had the lockdown for about three months. It ended in June 15. So we have that in different categories. Uh, we were at the highest level, which is ECQ, which is Enhanced Community Quarantine. And now we brought that down to a uh, GCQ, which is a general community quarantine. If you look at the, uh, the ASEAN countries, uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, and Phil the Philippines are in the top three countries that have more or less the highest infection. Um, we, I would say the Singapore, uh, for what had it under control, and then they had that sort of second wave, the Philippines, uh, it has taken us quite some time. There are two schools of thoughts that uh, uh, we could have actually opened the economy much earlier, but uh, our president felt that we, we, he wanted to be quite sure that the infection would be in control. Uh, the way I view it, this is really actually a, a health problem. Uh, previous crisis uh, that we've seen in the ASEAN crisis was more about the economy and in, in, in America, the banking crisis. This one stems from basically a health uh, situation. Uh, and uh, I'm part of the cabinet uh, and private sector. So you can see the dynamics between the cabinet and the, which is now called IATF. It's the highest body that really manages uh, the direction on uh, how to move forward on the uh, uh, opening up of the economy or, and uh, allowing uh, more businesses to restart. And it's a struggle between basically health and the economy, trying to save lives uh, and uh, of course livelihood. And the private sector has been quite strong that uh, uh, it, the economy is equally as important. Today, the, we've uh, faced about close to 8 million jobs lost uh, by the end of this year, could be rising to about 10 million jobs. Uh, many MSMEs uh, in the Philippines are affected with it because as the previous presenter said that nobody knows uh, how long this uh, problem will last. Uh, uh, we're all expecting a cure uh, to be discovered or even a treatment will, will greatly help. You know? Uh, the level of infection in the Philippines is close to uh, 31,000 as of today. The death rate is about 1,000, 1,100. So the death rate is not too bad. 
but the infection level, despite the uh, close to three months lockdown, has continued to go up. So I represent the private sector, and our strategy really is to yeah, focus really? on visibility. Uh, the only way to convince, I guess, in a CN, the only way to convince the yeah. government to open the economy is to create greater visibility. And the private sector has embarked on mass targeted testing. Unfortunately, uh, our Department of Health earlier on was slow to react in building testing capacity. You know? And uh, we, the private sector, together with the Red Cross, donated a lot of equipment. So testing actually creates a lot of visibility. We use basically rapid test kits to test all our employees. Uh, and, um, and of course, now we're in what we call full RT-PCR testing, which is basically swab testing. So uh, we are also helping our local government, you know, the, the, the cities to test. So uh, it is really a struggle. Um, many MSMEs at this point in time are uh, running out of cash. The banks have tightened their credit uh, because uh, since we opened uh, the economy, they want to see who can make it, how long can they survive. Uh, and it's a management really of cash flow, uh, the way I see it. And uh, our micro and small and medium entrepreneurs, that's basically 99.6% of the entire business community. It's almost the same in the 10 other countries. No? So yes, Vietnam, Cambodia, Brunei, and all of them have much lower infection levels. So whoever can, can control the health situation stands a better chance in uh, uh, opening up the economy more and going back to normal. No? So basically the retail sector, the tourism sector are all hit because of the new normal is prohibitive basically of uh, making many businesses viable, rental costs, uh, efficiencies. So, and of course confidence, consumer confidence is down because everybody is trying to save as much money as they can. They don't know how long this crisis will last uh, and uh, they're not spending. And social distancing is, is pretty is a big problem because 30 percent uh are allowed to enter a retail store a restaurant and of course right now all flights to different provinces in the philippines are are closed uh tourists are still not allowed to enter the philippines until we have a more effective system in determining uh testing as the tourists arrive because you get to be quarantined for two days to wait for the PCR, the swab test results. So how many tourists will really come to the Philippines and wait in a hotel for two or three days? No? So, but yes, we're moving along. We're, we're increasing that. I think within the ASEAN countries, we're, we're also trying to meet to see a, a common protocol that uh, the 10 countries can adopt together to strengthen uh, and bring back the tourism, at least within the region. So the, the first goal of the Philippines is to try to open the the, the areas within the country so that we can promote local tourism. So the way I see it, this is going to take some time. I think the worst is not over. It's going to, uh, I would say, get worse as we move on. Uh, and we will see more uh, uh, MSMEs really affected. And that, uh, that unfortunately is the consequence when um, the health situation is not really under control. No? So the other countries, uh, seven other countries have it under control, if you can see their infection level. But nevertheless, the massive testing that we'll be doing in the coming weeks uh, will allow us greater visibility. And uh, uh, quarantine will not now be on the basis of locking down an entire city or province, but will be more focused on, on buildings, on, on uh, residential areas. No? So that's the approach that is going to happen. Thank you. You know, Joey, thank you so much for very interesting comments. Um, perhaps um, I could ask panelists to keep their comments short, so we have time for a couple of questions at the end. But I have particular pleasure now in inviting Shinta Kamdani uh, to give her opening comments. I had the pleasure of meeting you, if you remember, at the House of Lords last year, and you're, of course, CEO of the Sentisa Group um, and Vice Chair of CADIN. Over to you, Shinta. Mute. Yes, we have. I think. Thank you, Baroness. Um, it's 
pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna try to be as brief as I can. I think we all uh, know, I think from the survey also have shown that the economic damages and outlook, um, including in Indonesia are no better than any other countries in the world. As, and also in neighboring countries in ASEAN. So uh, if we see the real uh, economic growth in the first quarter of 2020, we have um, growth about 2.7%. It's projected a second quarter to be minus uh, five, six percent. And uh, the question is the third quarter, that will be really the key. If um, the third quarter, Will be uh, will be uh, negative. Then that's where we're going to really enter the the recession. So um, if we look at the um, also the retail sales growth has been down uh, in May minus twenty two percent, and the PMI manufacturing has also uh, fall uh, much worse than we expected. Um, uh, number is now about twenty seven, and it's really. Uh, uh, much, much, it's like the lowest we ever experienced the last um, 17 years. So um, our biggest issue right now in Indonesia, obviously, as far as the damage is concerned, is in the unemployment. Because um, at the moment, uh, the number looks right now that um, the formal number, actually, we can't really, because uh, what's registered uh, as unemployment actually um, the number is not really real. What we, we, we got from all the sectors, uh, right now we have about 6 million already uh, out of jobs. And um, I think this number uh, keep on um, increasing, even uh, despite the fact that we are already starting our um, uh, new normal. Now, uh, our biggest problem is because we have about a, a very large uh, um, informal sector, informal worker, about 70 million. This is where uh, our focus should be, you know, the unemployment also relate to those that are, does not have um, income uh, in the informal sectors, including the MSMEs. Now, um, we also see that um, I think at the moment, when we look at the, the unemployment in Indonesia, this may also impact on our property rate. So Indonesia has to be, be very, very watchful in terms of the increase of this um, number. Now the government has given obviously many stimulus, but uh, at the moment our biggest issue, the number is, is uh, right now the number of the stimulus that the government has, uh, has uh, delivered um, to us, promised to deliver, I would say it's about um, uh, 690, uh, be, uh, tr uh, trillion rupiah, but uh, the number is still small in comparison to obviously what is needed because, um, as you know, it's about only four and a half percent of our GDP, whereas other countries has given more than uh, ten percent of their GDP. On top of that, we have problem in the realization of the stimulus, so it doesn't really get to the target uh, that we want. So uh, realization has been very weak. And we uh, government has focused on three aspects, on the health, social safety net, and of course, on the uh, recovery of the economy. Now, Indonesia return to work scheme of the new normal also was introduced at the end of, the May, of May. We have also followed the same uh, lockdown on um, because we, we are big archipelago with different um, region and provinces. So it's been done lockdown done based on each of the provinces. But uh, Jakarta, for example, uh, we have restart now the economic activities um, this uh, last two weeks, and uh, the timing is just right because actually a lot of companies are facing cash flow. So I completely uh, agree, Jenny, with your survey that really cash flow is a very big issue for for companies, and um, some companies doesn't doesn't even uh, last until um, end of June. So this is. This is a very big concern. Now, um, Indonesia, like uh, I, I mentioned also before, cannot really rely too much on the stimulus. So unlike, uh, maybe Tony can share it in Singapore where stimulus really get to the, unfortunately uh, it's not happening with us. So we are really continuing having to bombard our government and we continue, of course, uh, uh, giving inputs to our government, but, um, 
stimulus, whether that's uh, fiscal and credit relaxation has not really been uh, implemented as according what we want. And our biggest problem right now is the restructuring of credit. So despite that there is already regulations, but a lot of um, uh, our company has not been able to restructure its credit. So we have asked for about 1,600 trillion rupiah uh, for um, uh, in terms of um, economic uh, recovery fund. And uh, this especially will also include the, the fresh capital because at the moment on the recovery economy, it's not enough that you restructure your credit, but you also need to uh, get more capital to um, restart your business. So, um, all the restriction is almost uh, now uh, some has been relaxed. relaxed. Um, I think getting Indonesia back to work in, nor in new normal doesn't mean that the storm is over, definitely. I think to operate in the new normal, Indonesian businesses have to shoulder increased um, expenditure in health-related spending to ensure sufficient health protection. And this definitely in the health protocol, there is uh, already now increased in terms of um, costs in operating the new protocol and internally business also suffered uh, more again that we are uh, concerned on the layoff and the higher logistic costs due to the uh, uh, lockdown measures and limited of course shorter operational hours so even though now we already started opening there is a capacity limit to open and this will definitely impact the revenue generated by the business and it takes time so it's demand supply and uh, uh, demand and supply shock, right? So the demand also is not, is not able to come immediately back. Uh, and I think it will, will never see going back pre, uh, before the pandemic uh, until perhaps next year. I think some sector will, will even be longer than that. And uh, this definitely impact in the, the, um, the consumption also level um, whether that's in, um, inside or um, um, external where we, where we do our export has, uh, has been really down. So um, only business which may generate enough capital, create enough income to meet cash flow demand, highly responsive to changes in market demand are able to create new form of efficiency in business uh, process can uh, stay af afloat. So I wanted to just close with um, a number of aspects that uh, we believe, I believe is important uh, that uh, what does business need to consider for the new normal? I think market behavior will change permanently because of the COVID. This revisit and overhaul of the business model, business pro process, supply chain and market approach might be necessary. A lot of business needs to trans transform. Adapt, adapt, adoption of technology also is important, will be uh, fast forwarded and in, in, enable to maintain, um, of course, the business competitiveness. This is what Indonesia also now is, needs to be paid attention on its competitiveness. Uh, third is changes or adjustment on the employ, employment and management model to accommodate, uh, uh, of course, higher remote working capability. Now we've seen uh, you know, a combination of working from home, working from office and so forth. And throughout the adjustment process, business may choose to integrate a certain values, which is uh, beneficial for business to adopt due to its persistent market features. So uh, exists before COVID and will survive after COVID, such as trend uh, towards sustainable business, for example, climate friendly business, SDG um, and so forth. This is to create the higher value to the to transform business in the new normal and post COVID era. So I think this is a time, the momentum that we also need to take while we are resetting the button. Thank you. Shinta, thank you so much. And we now move on finally to Tony Cripps, who's us, the CEO of HSBC in Singapore. Um, he's worked at the bank for 30 years. And of course, he's also uh, been in the Philippines, in Australia and now in Singapore. Tony, over to you. Thank you very much, Baroness. I'll be uh, I'll be brief. Um, I'm just going to concentrate on the financial impact of this naturally as a banker. Um, so, what has surprised the markets, um, commentators especially, is how quickly equity and debt markets have recovered. Now, the conversations that central banks and governments were having a couple of years ago, of which I was lucky enough to be involved, is what happens when the next economic crisis hits? Where's the firepower with central banks? 
And the answer was not much because interest rates in many developed countries were close to zero. So it was going to rely always on a, on a huge fiscal response to refloat an economy for whatever reason. So it's safe to say that that experiment has now been um, seen. We've seen what's happened. We've seen eight trillion of global demand disappear from the global economy virtually overnight. But what we've also seen is central banks and governments put in seven to eight trillion of economic stimulus through various mechanisms. And that is why equity markets have recovered and it's why credit markets, um, certainly at the institutional level, uh, are very, very, very liquid. In fact, the amount of money printing just in the US alone is seeing money growth in the order of 25%. That's a rate of printing that is double the 70s, um, which for those of you who study economics would realize that that was the peak of money growth for the last 30 years. So markets are gonna stay afloat because of central bank and government policy. Now, now the important thing is with all of this excess liquidity, how do you translate it into the real economy? And there's varying degrees of success that we've seen across the globe um, and, and indeed across ASEAN. In Singapore, the mechanism of getting the money from the banks which had access to central bank funding into the SME sector was through a guaranteed scheme where the government will guarantee 90% of the credit lent to an SME and therefore banks became obviously very confident that the government stood behind those loans. So that created a transfer mechanism. At a retail level, um, mortgage moratoriums were immediately put in place and agreed by the major banks, um, interest holidays, debt repayment holidays, etc. So it was virtually like you switched off the lights. Now what's going to be surprising economically is when the light switch comes back on, and we've seen evidence of this already in China and in the US, two economies that are the most important in the world, both kind of with, with different responses to the COVID-19 crisis. China well controlled, reopening, um, will we'll of course have second phase in certain places like Beijing, but the containment and, and lockdown mechanisms will be local rather than um, country-wide. And what we've seen in China, surprisingly to most economists, is about 80% of economic activity has recovered. And we're seeing that through anecdotal evidence, plus in surprising growth in, in, in purchasing manager surveys or economic stats in general. And what we're starting to see, even though the US has a different response, they seem to be going down a more herd mentality where there's going to be lots more infections and a lot less control over mitigation. Um, the economic numbers, nevertheless, have rebounded at a rate that has never been seen in history. Uh, retail spending is back, um, employment regrowth is back in consumer sectors. Um, of course, not all the way back, but it is nevertheless rebounding at rates that no economist will predict because no one's seen this particular um, severity in terms of a downturn before. So look, from a finance point of view, there is enough liquidity to support growth. Um, it's the translation mechanism, particularly in emerging markets, that, that is you know, more difficult, uh, obviously, than developed markets, especially ones like Singapore. But notwithstanding that, we see, as, as governments understand that there's enough science now to know that this disease is awful, but not if you're under the age of 50 and you don't have a pre-existing condition. So there's whole parts of the economy that actually can afford with pretty low risk to reopen because mortality levels, you know, um, are very, very low um, if, you, if you're in that particular category, which not, well, let's face it, is, is the majority of most populations. So I'll leave it there, Baroness, um, as you said, to allow time for questions. So, Tony, thank you. Uh, on a more optimistic note, which was great to end. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do one round with the panel because we're very tight on time, having to finish by 10. Um, so perhaps you, I could give you the questions and then perhaps I could, each of you could comment and make any, any final uh, marks. Um, I mean, I suppose the first question is Tony sees growth returning. Um, do the panel agree in their country? So that would be question number one. Secondly, there's a question about um, SMEs from KH Chin. And Joey, I think this will be for you as President Duterte's advisor. Um, and a champion of SMEs. Um, Jenny referred to SMEs being particularly vulnerable in her excellent presentation, um, particularly in managing cash flow and liquidity. What are your observations on that? And then I've got a question from Doug Marriott about energy costs. 
how significant have they been during this period? Is it a priority? And my comment is that they have obviously come down. And then a fourth question from Aaron Saw about health and safety um, and the protocol. Is that increasing costs and creating environmental waste and reducing capacity? You know, which do you think would be the lesser evil to continue business operations um, and spend on remote working capabilities or increase the health and safety protocol? And I think that would be my comment and question to you. Is the change that we're going to see going to be about working practices, more from home, changing skills, more digital, or is it going to be more about business continuity, health and safety in the workplace? So perhaps I could take the panel. Why don't we start with you, Joey, because you're going to, if you would, comment on the particular SME issue. Thank you. The challenge with many of the MSMEs, well, we have in the Philippines, we have a lot of micro entrepreneurs, it's about 90% of them are uh, micro. The challenge really here is working capital. And uh, the businesses that they're in are basically in retail. Uh, and this area is uh, pretty much challenged because of the new normal. Social distancing definitely makes most of these businesses uh, not viable. Rental cost. Uh, Yes, some of the landlords are bringing the rental cost, uh, rental rates down, but still you have the overhead and uh, many of them have uh, decided to close shop in the meantime. Uh, if our advice to them is just uh, save your cash because uh, they, our, our entrepreneurs in the Philippines uh, mix their cash with their family savings. So you don't want them to uh, wipe out their family savings and then that becomes a huge problem so uh, that's the advice of many of our uh, mentors who are mentoring many of these msme so the situation is not true for all agriculture is uh, a savior because many of our farmers are msmes and we have this mom and pop uh, sari sari stores which we call that sell basically essential food so there's close to 1.5 million of these mini stores so they're, they're uh, somehow uh, shielded from this. So th that's how we're coping up. I, and the banks are a little bit more flexible. They're just trying to refinance uh, basically their, their uh, uh, lines and uh, their interest uh, uh, expenses are being flowed back into the loans. So, so, but for how long? I don't think these people will be able to last beyond six months. No? Uh, and uh, eventually most of them will, will, will close. Jerry, thank you. Tony, shall we go to you next? You've got this specific question on growth and um, any other comments on any of the other questions, please. Um, yeah, sure. So, look, it is going to be very painful and I don't want to create an impression that there isn't going to be a huge tail effect and impact. But I do think, um, to Joey's comments earlier, as antiviral drugs become um, effective and we're already seeing evidence um, and as an understanding of um, the particular risk segments in the economies are apparent, then people will, you know, start going back to restaurants and start to leave their homes. So I'm I'm fairly certain that we'll see that over the next few months, and and hopefully that feeds through. But there are permanent changes. Um, the question on what does the workplace look like? I think most large companies were were pushing towards, you know, sort of. 15 to 20 percent work remotely, work flexibly for a whole range of reasons and trying to factor that into cost plans um, and flexibility plans for, for staff. Well that figure now we've proven. Um, most companies, large companies have operated at 80 or 90 percent remote working across BCP environments with the right technology. So I'm certain that that figure is now 25 to 30 percent which then does have a big impact on the demand for you know, head office space. Um, it, it also has an incredibly positive benefit for uh, economies probably outside major urban centres. Um, that that's another way of looking at it, and it's a positive way of looking at it. So um, that that is a permanent shift. Thank you. And, and Jenny, would you like to come in? Oh, sure. I, I think uh, I I won't probably as a lot of a, a great comment on it. That maybe from a particular being based in China and look at the China business as well. Maybe share a little bit of uh, 
uh, you know, the rebound story might be lifted everybody's uh, spirit in, in, in somehow. Definitely, I think survival is the first uh, thing. Because without survival, there's no such rebound in a way. But, but definitely, uh, as I, I think uh, uh, Tony mentioned already, China uh, basically eighty percent already pretty much regained, and in certain sectors even stronger, and, and not just uh, regained, but actually really actually uh, did, you know doubling the business, medical um, uh, for sure, and then. Even uh, the, the sector like the luxury, because Chinese uh, can't really traveling overseas right now. And so there's the different the stories, but I think I'll put it this way. I'll, I'll use three words. I think it's a, I, I mentioned about the three A's, but in a uh, uh, um, way, but also it's about agility. And we have to keep on toe and then actually expect how consumers are also going to be react. Yeah. You know, whether are they going to uh, it's it's an overall social, you know, government policy driven overall environment basically, but it also consumer behavior. After the long lockdown, as an example, people be excited to be able to return or resume, start to resume and have to take back better to the normal. And so it's about agility, it's about resilience as well. It's unfortunately this will last for some time uh, four more months, I don't know. And already experiencing a baking uh, situation. So there's a possibility of um, uh, a resurgence in the winter time, uh, but it's about agility, uh, resilience, and expectations on how consumers going to be reacting. Uh, uh, maybe it's quite relevant to the ASEAN economy. Uh, our group, Ritmo, actually, uh, we have a strategic partnership with Alibaba in China. And so we were very fortunate in a way, right before the COVID-19, we have our uh, Cartier's open flagship store digitally on the mall, which was a uh, did a, a wonderful business. It's better, even better than expected. Consumer does behave uh, differently, and and so how how ready we are as business to be tapping the new technology, tapping the new wave, and tapping the new consumer behavior. I think all these things gonna help uh, as as business start to look at the rebound end. Thank you. And I think this consumer behavior point that you brought out is a very important one to add to our list uh, and to the work going forward. Shinta. Yes, I think I agree with Jenny. And I think um, I mentioned before about uh, demand and supply shock. And it, this is where it is, right? I think uh, when we talk about consumer behavior, we also have to see consumer demand, not just from the economic side, but also the confidence, consumer confidence. You know, I think uh, with this whole health condition right now, we really see without the vaccine being found that we have to live with this COVID, right? And how much is the sensitivity of each of the consumer in terms of um, their confidence, bringing their confidence back with all this, this uh, even the health protocol being in place. And we're, we're talking about also mobility of, of people from um, across. And I think this is really what will impact the most that will be these little isolated places uh, and to go across uh, globally. I think this, this will be a big issue. But I wanted to, to touch that um, at the end of the day, um, that it is important that this is a work that needs that we need to understand that that this is a collaborative work, right? In order for us to survive this, in order for us to to uh, to go uh, fight COVID, this is a work where government, private sector, and really civil society needs to really get their mindset. At the end of the day, do we want to to have this growth? Like, do we want to go to that uh, direction of fighting, um, and being able to win over COVID? And a lot of time, I think governments and, and um, people are, are facing issues in terms of is each of the discipline of even following the protocols is is big issue for countries like us. So so while we are wanting the demand to to come back, I think we also need to understand that the the the, the discipline and mindset of people are wanting to 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 be able to um to go back to to normal to i know this is we call new normal but to to really be able to 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 um uh to to see a, a better uh future post COVID. i think thank, this needs thank, to thank be you Shinta. Of, uh, i think that's a very good note to end on i'm afraid we're out of time i think you'll all disappear in a minute 
Thank you so much. Thanks to Dr. Kwong and the Asian BAC. Thanks to my team at UK ABC. And thanks to all the speakers, to Jenny, to Joey, to Shinta and to Tony for a really, really interesting session. It will be the first of many discussions. Thank you all very much indeed. That ends today's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you.